retired horticulture teacher nurtures and protects a community garden on Protection Island that feeds the body and the soul of the people who live there. I am Jesse Zhang, and my guest on Coast Connections is retired horticulture teacher, the manager of Protection Island Community Garden, Jim Harris. Protection Island Community Garden has become the island pantry, the education base, and the gathering place. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for inviting me, Jesse. What is a community garden, and how did it get started? Well, I'll answer the first part last about how it got started. In 2006, a group of like-minded islanders decided we would, like a, we would like a community garden on Protection Island. We really didn't know what we were doing, but I will describe to you the sort of steps we took in case there's someone listening who would like to know how you start one of these things. Uh, we first formed a committee and we met and discussed some of the ideas that we would like to include in our garden. We then made a point of going online and checking, among other things, the American Community Garden Association website. We uh, also visited a lot of local community gardens that were in existence then. And out of that, we came up with a plan. We then went to the city of Nanaimo, to the parks department, explained that we like a community garden. And they gave us a lot of advice, but probably the most important thing any community garden can have, they gave us a piece of park land. A lot of community gardens don't get secure tenure on land, but the city of Nanaimo was really fantastic and gave us, promised us a chunk of park land. We then went back and did some more planning. We had to form a nonprofit society. That's when we became Diggs, Douglas Island Garden Society. And then the uh, Parks Department prepped us and got us ready to present to the whole council, that is Parks, Recreation and Culture Commission. We presented to them, uh, they listened, and they didn't give us all we wanted, but they gave us a small portion of land to build a community garden on. They were also excellent in that they provided us with all the hard materials, the soil, the posts, the fencing, uh, the lumber. We supplied the labor, so it's a 50-50 deal. We built 12 beds in our community garden, and it was so successful that we went back to the commission two years later and asked for an extension. And now we have about 30 beds uh, that we use for various purposes in our community garden. And that's how we got our community garden. I don't know if I'd recommend that as a starting process for everybody, but it's what worked for us. What a impact does uh, the garden bring to local community? Um, I have to state, first of all, we're not a very big community garden. If you visit other community gardens, they're acres in size. Our garden is about the size of a small city lot. So we don't pretend to grow enough food to feed everybody on Protection Island. But what we try and do is, first of all, offer a social experience. We meet every week every Saturday or Sunday, depending on the season. Uh, we meet at 10 o'clock, we sit down and discuss gardening problems, we assign jobs, we work for an hour or so, and then we meet at the end, have a cup of coffee, share gossip, talk more about gardening. It's a wonderful place for you to meet your neighbor, it's a wonderful place to find out the gossip on the island. It just is a wonderful social experience. But the other thing we tr try to do anyways is to educate and inspire people. It's been my experience that a lot of the things your grandparents and my grandparents would have taken for granted about gardening, it's been forgotten. People don't know how to, believe it or not, plant seeds. They don't know how to prune. It's all been forgotten. So what we try and do is we try and demonstrate ways that people can grow different crops in the shade, maybe not in the sun. We tell them, show them which ones are deer proof. We, uh, we do everything we can to encourage them to start their own little garden at home. And we hope the message spreads across, across the island. And uh, that's, that's what we hope to do. Sounds like a fun place to go. And uh, I never thought about uh, like the knowledge if we don't practice will actually fade out. Exactly, it will disappear. Yeah. How do you um, raise money to cover the expenses for garden? Good question. Um, it's surprising how much money it takes to run a community garden. 
it's things like soil and fertilizer and lime and lumber and equipment like lawnmowers and road, that sort of thing. So you need a source of money if you're planning on starting a community garden. And again, I'm not going to su suggest that the way we raise money is the way everybody should raise money, but I'll outline how we do it and people can do what they wish with it. Uh, first of all, we charge a membership. So if you want to join, have you joined this year? You haven't joined. Well, we invite everyone on Protection Line to join. It's $10 for a single, or if you and your husband join, it's $15. We also have some allotment beds. They're 24 feet long, 4 feet wide, and we charge people $30 for the use of that for a year. And then we have a series of fundraisers through the year. So coming up in May is our biggest fundraiser. It's our plant and bake sale. Uh, and we've been preparing all winter long. We have a greenhouse. We've been getting plants ready. And we will have quite a selection of plants come May the 13th. Uh, we also, at that point, offer baked goods. Seems to be a nice combination, baked goods and flowers. Then after that, we have on the summer solstice, around June 21st, we have a dessert auction. Islanders make up their best desserts. We bring it in. And we give them something to drink, and then we bid them, bid them off, and, or auction them off, and it really works well. After that, uh, we have the fall fair. That's sometime in September. Uh, we also have a gentleman in the garden who was a garlic farmer and knows how to braid garlic. And one of our successful fundraisers is auctioning off garlic braids. Uh, we also participate in the John Barsby program of manure, so we barge manure over and we sell it to the islanders. And that's what we do to raise money. And so far, uh, the islanders have been very supportive. They, they buy into all our fundraisers. They participate and they're willing to, to pay for things so that we can keep the garden going. But if you are starting a community garden, you should think about a revenue stream. Sounds like a lot of brilliant idea. You, you must have the mo money more than you need. I only wish in my <laughs> wildest dreams. We always seem to find things to spend money on. What's the biggest challenge you faced? The biggest challenge? This was surprising for me. Uh, I would have thought vandalism and people picking when they shouldn't would be a problem. But I was advised by some of the gardens we went to that you never lock your gates. People can come in and go as they wish. And there's been very little, very little vandalism. There's been a couple of garlic braids gone missing, some over-harvesting of the raspberries, that sort of thing. But the islanders sort of look after the garden, and they've done a very good job. But to your question, the biggest problem, the biggest problem is men. And the problem is we don't have enough of them. We have a lot of lady gardeners, uh, very social, very cooperative, very uh, innovative, a lot of manual dexterity. But women really shouldn't be lifting a lot of soil. They shouldn't be lifting big timbers and that sort of thing. And so what we're acutely short of is men to do the kind of grunt work. And I don't know why. We've managed so far, but I don't know what will happen in the future. So maybe need to promote something like uh, invited the men and say, uh, come to our garden, and uh, our tomato would like to see you. <laughs> <laughs> you could try it, or we could pay them. I don't know what, but we don't have enough men. I've heard uh, um, you teach a program called Little Diggers. Can you tell us about it? I do teach a program called Little Diggers, um, and we've been doing that now for 10 years or so. Um, first, the name, Little Diggers. Uh, although our garden is on Protection Island, we call ourselves the Douglas Island Garden Society, because that's the official name of our island. So we are DIGS, Douglas Island Garden Society. Uh, and so we, it was a natural thing to call the little gardeners little diggers. And now we call the adults the big diggers. Anyways, we meet at the same time as the adults. That's every Saturday or Sunday. The little diggers come at 1030. Uh, we do a little lesson with them to teach them something about horticulture, some of the theory. And then we let them get their hands dirty. We turn them loose in the dirt, and they plant or dig or water or whatever. And then we meet again. We have a story read to them about gardening. And then I give them a drink box and a cookie. And I ask them questions. And if they get questions right, they get more cookies. <laughs> and then they leave. And uh, it's wonderful. And to w as to why we do it, um, I feel strongly about this. The kids bring to the garden a whole different atmosphere. Uh, 
Imagine a garden just full of old people like me wandering around, pretty dull. When you get kids there, there's a kind of vitality, there's an interest, there's a spark. And when you get the two of them together, a real kind of magic takes place. But more importantly, these little diggers, these little kids are the future of our garden. If we don't involve them and inspire them and turn them on to gardening, then our, our garden is doomed. We'll just eventually die out. So that's about the digs program and that's why I think it's important and I would recommend anyone who's thinking about a community garden, you gotta involve the kids right from the start and in all the garden activities. I totally agree with you. Thank you. Especially in digital era, can you imagine all the kids with the device, they just play computer or whatever, cell phone, and this way go out for gardening and get outdoor exercise knowledge. That's very healthy. And they meet with the other kids Happy, on the island. Yes. yes. And we take them from any from breastfeeding. We have some that are breastfeeding still. <laughs> That's quite the same. They're very, very little <laughs> diggers. Uh, uh, up to, uh, anyways, the eight or nine years old. Yep. Interesting. Uh, so it's been more than 10 years this community garden yes. developed. Uh, now it's not uh, only popular among islanders, also popular for the visitors. Yes, it is. Last year, some visitors were very impressed about the tomato tower or strawberry tower and the apple tree. So interesting <laughs> because the apple tree bend it. That's right. And why not a normal just stand the street? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> you may remember a couple of questions ago, you asked me what the impact was. And I said we were trying to educate people about gardening and what you can do. And what we try and do is demonstrate different ways of gardening. So the trees, trees grow up, right? Yes. Unless you cordon them. And a cordon is when you take an apple tree and bend it to a 45 degree angle and you can grow them. We grow them on a yard or a meter uh, spacing. So imagine the number of apple trees you could get in this studio, just planting them a meter apart. And each tree will give us 50 apples. It takes a special kind of pruning, but for islanders who live on small properties, it's perfect. The potato tower is another example. To grow potatoes, you, you've, all, you've seen a potato field. We don't have fields like that. We have small lots. And so we grow our potatoes up, basically just boxes. And we plant them as we go. And we can get 50 pounds of potatoes from each, each box. So again, those are good examples of what we try to do to educate, promote different and novel ways of gardening. Where did you get those ideas? We steal them, Jesse, wherever <laughs> we can. <laughs> We're not shy. <laughs> One of the other things we do is we take field trips, our community garden takes, and so we will visit other gardening enterprises. The trees come from Bob Duncan. Bob Duncan is the master fruit grower down in Saanich, and he was the one who told us and showed us how you can cordon apples. So it's Bob's idea, it's not our idea. The strawberry tower came out of a book once, I read it once, it was kind of a neat idea. I have no idea where the potato tower came from. It just sort of appeared somewhere. But yes, we will, we uh, check other gardens, we read, we inquire, and we will take ideas from anywhere. Sounds very productive. I that so. kind of space and that amount of produce. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. So um, now it's springtime. Many people who watch the program maybe want to know uh, how they start the vegetables. What recommendation you have? Well, um, I would suggest if anyone in Nanaimo wants to start a community, uh, start a their own garden, uh, probably the best thing to do is check with their neighbors. Nanaimo's got all kinds of microclimates, some places warmer, some places colder, some drier, some wetter. So if you start with your neighbors and ask them, what do you grow? How does it work? How much did you plant? What did you do with it? That's a good source of information. If you don't have neighbors that garden, maybe there's a community garden near you and community gardeners love to talk about gardens. They would help you. If you don't have neighbors, you don't have a community garden, next best place is a nursery. And there are lots of nurseries around town with well-staffed, well-informed uh, attendants, and they'd be glad to answer questions like that. 
Another good source is the West Coast Seed Company. Their catalog has not only seeds that are specific for this area, but they have a planting guide in the front, which would tell you under carrots, plant in April, or cauliflower, plant in May, something like that. Uh, and if all else fails, give me a call. I think my number and email address will be on here later, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. So, what makes you so passionate about the garden? Jesse, I wish I knew. Uh, some very wise people have said, if you don't have a passion in your life, your life is not all it should be. And I don't know where I got my passion, but I think I was the only teenager who had a vegetable garden and just loved it. Um, my summer holidays, I worked on an experimental farm. I started to teach and I started with social studies and I ended up teaching horticulture and running the school greenhouse and gardening program. Then I retired from teaching and I found myself working in a retail nursery and I worked there for four or five years running greenhouses and so on. And then I moved to Protection Island and before I know it I had a garden and one wasn't enough, I had to have another one. I don't know why but there's something about gardening which is endlessly satisfying for me and I hope for some others too. I'm curious, so is your family like your father was the farm? I, my so, so your interest just uh, you grew up by, your, it's by yourself? It's bizarre. Yeah, my, <laughs> none of my brothers or siblings are interested in gardening. I don't know. I just uh, I count myself lucky, though, to have for had this passion find me. I didn't find it. It found me, and it and it. Uh, I, I just can't imagine life without a garden. I'm sorry. I checked out all the plants as I came in. They're, they're, they're in good shape. Yeah. With your many years experience, how do you see the future of gardening? Well, I wish I could tell the future. If I could do that, I would be out buying lottery tickets now. Um, there's some encouraging signs, Jesse. Uh, one is the 100-mile diet. People seem to be interested in food security and where their food comes from. And then there's the organic movement. People are interested in what's in their food, and that leads them maybe to think about growing their own food. Um, so th those are encouraging signs. I think what's missing, the big problem if, we, if gardeners face a problem is land. People are moving to cities uh, more and more and there's, there isn't much land in a city. You might have a balcony if you're lucky but you won't have a backyard and you won't have a front yard. And this is where I think uh, city planners and municipal uh, planners have to make sure that for people that have this desire to garden that there is some public land that they can use on some kind of, or some sort of arrangement, rental or lease or whatever. So I can't imagine gardening disappearing. I, I can see it changing shape and morphing into something different. But if I was to change one thing, it would be making sure that everybody had access to some small plot of land somewhere. I just recently saw they have a, a new technology and like you can grow plants from the water. So what do you think about that? Like, it, like they, they no need the earth. It's called hydroponics. Oh. And that's where the best marijuana is grown. <laughs> oh, I see. And the, the guys who, hydroponics is uh, kind of a, a, way, a way of the future. It's a way of getting away from soil yeah. so that you can grow in other places that don't necessarily have land, in factories, in buildings. And you can grow, you can grow things up. You don't have to necessarily go out. Um, it is, it's, it's not as easy as it looks. It's not quite water, you just put it. What's very difficult is getting the balance of nutrients in the water I see. correct. And behind any hydroponic uh, uh, organization or any hydroponic factory or farm or whatever you call it, there will be a, a, a pond of water. And that water is what's key. It has to have the right pH. It has to have the right micronutrients. It has to have all the major nutrients in. It has to be the right temperature. And it can't get blocked either. You know, a hose can't get kinked or broken or plugged. And making sure that that nutrient solution gets to every plant all the time is demanding. Uh, I've tried it. Didn't work so well. I see. Didn't work so well. So I have all kinds of respect for 
people that can do it. But if you can get that part of it going, you can grow indoors where you're not plagued with a lot of diseases. Um, you can grow things up, it saves space. Yeah. And I think you're going to see more and more of that kind of soilless agriculture. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. So we've talked about how wonderful a community garden, like education and the social connection and a fun place to go. So what if others want to follow? They want to start a community garden. How would they start? Well, uh, if, if they're in Naimo, and I don't know if it's true of anywhere else, then I, I think that uh, you're very lucky because the city runs a program called the VIP program, which stands for Volunteers in Parks. And unlike a lot of other cities where the city administration will tell people who live near a park what's going to happen in the park, Nanaimo works the other way. They want the people who live around the park to tell them what they want to do. And so if you're thinking of starting a community garden in Nanaimo, the first place you should go is to the parks department and tell them what you want to do. It, it, maybe you have a place in mind in a park somewhere and see what they can work out for you. The other good thing about the VIP program is that they will pay for all the hard structure. Again, the soil, timber, installation of water, they pay for all that you, if you supply the labor. And I, I don't know of any other municipality or city that does that. So that's what, that would be my recommendation. Uh, go and see Richard Harding at the Parks Department, explain what your plans are, and they're usually very, very, very helpful. Sounds like that's a procedure. Let's recap that. So you need a, um, you have the plan, then you apply, then you, you come to community, you do a little bit of survey, then you present to the city again. Yes. But the good thing is the city will pay for some cost. They right? will cover all the hard costs. Uh, but they want you, you to build it. Just one time or like every year they, they'll well, they, share some cost? They have been good about sharing. They pay for all the water year in, year out. But yeah. we have done some additions that we have paid for. I haven't gone back to the city and asked for more. I presume it's startup costs they're covering, the startup costs. Yeah, that's good to know for people who want to start a program like this. It is, it is. Yeah. Um, Jim, you, you said uh, you like a quote called the gardener play with dirt. Can you explain that? <laughs> <laughs> you really like play with the dirt? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I like playing with dirt, but uh, dirt is not dirt. That's the wrong name for it to start. It's <laughs> called soil. Yes. And it's a very complex organism, soil. And most people don't realize that. It's a very thin layer around the earth, and all our food comes from that one small layer, no place else. And we're only beginning or trying to, we're only starting to understand the processes that go on in that, in that thin layer. And for me, the challenge is to get that layer perfect. Where I plant my plants, I want that soil to be as, as the best I can possibly make it so the plants will grow to their optimum. And it's, it's not easy. And if you are thinking about improving soil, it takes a long time. It doesn't happen over one season. It's a gradual process. And I'm very proud of my soil. I don't go around bragging about it, but, <laughs> but I'm proud of my soil. I've worked hard at it. And it's, it's giving me back all kinds of food in all kinds of different forms. Um, it's a thing of beauty. I'm sorry, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That's a strong connection with the soil. Very strong. And the, because you think that's a beauty. Yes. I, I hope more people think that way. There would uh, more people involved in the garden. It could be. Right? Uh, the problem is most people still think of it as dirt. And they think it's... 
I don't think they realize the wonderful qualities. They always think of it as sticky and it's in your way and it's muddy and no, it's, it's not that at all. It's, it's a living, that's the part to get your mind around. It's a living thing. And we're able to kill it and that's not good, but yes, it is a living organism. Yep. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing your insight and experience. Well, you. You're welcome. Jim has showed us a way to contribute a way to fashion a coast lifestyle and a way to create social connections. Thank you for joining us on Coast Connections. I'm your host, Jesse Zhang.